Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we start into a new series on energy resources. The topic for the day is going to be non-renewable energy usage. So, as always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going for the day. By the end of this video, two things I need you to know or be able to do. The first one is be able to describe patterns of energy usage in America and abroad. And the second is to discuss factors that must be considered when selecting an energy source. So this whole series is going to be about first non-renewable energy sources and then renewable energy sources. So let's jump in and start talking about what non-renewable resources are. Very simply defined, a non-renewable resource is a resource that cannot be renewed. It cannot come back. Once it's gone, it's gone. And these are resources that generally take a long time to form. So an example would be oil, coal, or natural gas. Those are resources that form through natural processes, but the formation of them takes hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. So for all of our intents and purposes, they're considered to be a non-renewable resource. Um, two major non-renewable resources that the world uses for energy would be fossil fuels, so coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear fuels. We'll talk about both of those in more detail later on. For now, I want to jump in and give you a quick refresher on units because these are words that I'm going to use frequently. So you need to know that the base unit for energy consumption or usage is a joule. A joule technically is using one watt of energy for one second. Remember from way back when a watt is basically how much energy is flowing into a device. A gigajoule is one billion joules. A megajoule is one billion gigajoules. So jot those down, have them for reference later on. I want to jump in by talking about annual energy consumption, and this is talking about globally. So this isn't focusing just on America. This is looking around the world and how the world uses energy. So if you look at our graph here, we're going to start with the biggest one, that yellow chunk. Globally, oil accounts for 34% of the world's energy usage. Natural gas accounts for 21%. Coal and peat, which are going to be things that are burned, dug up and burned, those account for 26% of energy usage, renewable energy is 13%, and then nuclear fuel is 6%. If you look all the way around that graph, fossil fuels account for 81% of energy usage around the world. So that's basically where the world gets its energy from. Now, as far as an individual comparison goes of which countries use how much energy and whether we're talking about per person or per country, a couple things that I want to point out here. Obviously, this graph is terribly skewed and major things that you need to know. The purple bar is total energy consumption so that is going to be for the whole country. The blue bar is per capita so that is per person. If we look at our graph here down on this end of the graph you can see that the biggest total en energy consumer globally is the Uni United States. So as a country we consume the most energy on an annual basis of any country in the world. Though I think a lot of people would argue that China is probably chasing us pretty close on this one. And then if you want to look at the per person breakdown, the per capita breakdown, Canadians use the most energy per person in an, on an annual basis. But if you want to compare it country to country, look at Canada's per capita energy use compared to ours. So their people individually use more, but as a country, they use way less energy per year than we do. So this is kind of a quick breakdown. The least energy consuming country in the world is going to be Tanzania. And you can see them right there. They barely make it onto the graph. So your energy consumption is going to all depend on where you live. If you live in a developed country, supporting your lifestyle that you're used to takes a bunch of energy to make the goods that you use, to heat your home, to air condition your home, to produce your food. If you li live in a developing country, then your lifestyle is not energy intensive at all because you're not consuming many goods, you probably don't have heating, you probably don't have air conditioning. So just simply as a product of where you live and the way you live your life, your energy consumption is going to be very different from one country to the next. As we talk about energy, it's very important to talk about how energy usage changes over time. And a lot of countries follow the same pattern. The pattern we're looking at right here is for America. And we're going to kind of talk about America through the rest of this video. But I want to point out a couple of key transitions in this graph here. So we start out with wood, and most countries, as they start developing, their main energy source will be wood because wood is readily available in the environment. You don't have to process it. You just go cut it down and use it. So wood was the major source of energy in America until you get to around 1875. 
1875, we are in the smack middle of the Industrial Revolution. We have learned how to start mining coal. We are using it in our factories. We are using it in our homes. So coal production and usage takes off. And you can see that coal is our major energy source for a long time, really until about the 1940s or 50s. In the 1950s, this is where oil extraction became really profitable, really easy, and oil started to become our major source of energy. Now, I know that oil is processed into gasoline, so when I talk about oil and gas, we're talking about the same thing. So 1950s, that's where we see oil really start to take off as our major source of energy. Now, there have been ups and downs. In the 70s, natural gas started to come on and start to be a bigger player. So there was a dip in oil, that would be the oil crisis of the 70s, and then we got through it, and oil consumption took off again. Natural gas consumption has gone up, down, and up. At the moment, in uh, North America, natural gas consumption is gonna be going way up because of fracking, and we've started to learn how to access more natural gas resources, so we're gonna see this natural gas number go up over time. And then, right here in the late 70s, early 80s, nuclear energy started to come on the scene as well. So all this just kind of shows how a country's energy usage and consumption portfolio changes over time. Also while talking about America, it's good to recognize that our system has inputs and outputs just like any other system. And there was something back on that last slide that I forgot to mention. You need to know that in order of importance for America, our major sources of energy is oil. Oil is our most important, followed by coal, which is second, natural gas, which is third. So for America, those are our major fuel sources in order, oil, coal, natural gas. If we look at our American inputs and outputs for the energy system, you can see a couple things by this diagram. Inputs into our system, we got coal coming in. We got natural gas, coal is 25% of our energy, natural gas is 22%. We got oil right here and petroleum imports. Okay, so if you put oil and petroleum imports together, this would be oil from home, and that would be international. That is 50% right there of our consumption. You also got some nuclear, you got renewable. Now, we do export just a little bit of oil and natural gas and coal globally, so we do export some of our energy. As far as outputs go, you've got 23% of our energy going to residential uses, 20% going to commercial, 33% going to industrial uses, and 29% going to transportation. As far as outputs, this does not account for wasted heat. If you remember second law of thermodynamics, there is always heat lost in energy transfers, and then you've got the pollutants that are given off as well. So we've got carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and tons of other pollutants that are given off when you burn fossil fuels. As we make decisions about what kind of energy we want to use, we need to consider the energy quality. And the energy quality is basically how much energy is contained in a given weight of a fuel. If you want to compare wood versus fossil fuels, wood is not very energy dense. You know, you can have a big old log, but it may not put off that much energy when you burn it as compared to like a gallon of gasoline, which gives off a ton of energy when you burn it. And also, the startup of those two are different. Wood takes a little while to get going, uh, fire, or not fire, gasoline, once you light it, that's an explosive um, reaction. So you have to consider the best energy source for the job. For heating a house, you know, a log in the fireplace might be the way to go, but you certainly aren't going to stick a log in your gas tank to run your car. So the rest of this video is basically going to be about considerations that need to be made when you are deciding what energy source is the best source of energy for the job. And one of the major considerations that you need to make is the efficiency. Now when we talk about efficiency, we're not talking about the efficiency of the final device that's using the energy. We are talking about the efficiency of the entire system. So this is going to walk you through the system of producing electricity using coal. So here's where we start out. You got your energy resource. Here's your coal in the ground. Now in the process of extracting that coal, you are going to use energy. There's going to be energy lost to heat and noise and all kinds of stuff. So we're using some energy to extract it. Then we're going to use some energy to transport it. Again, in this process, you lose energy to light, heat, sound. Then we got to process it. In there, we lose some more energy. We have got to burn it in order to make electricity, which is going to lose some more energy. We then have to either transport and dispose of the waste, which is more energy lost. We have to um, make the electricity, more electricity lost. 
and then we got to send it to the end user. Now, if we're talking about making electricity using coal, we are working at roughly 35% efficiency. So that means that if you put in 100 joules of energy to begin with, or if you start with 100 joules of energy, only 35 joules make it to the end user to actually do work. And this does not include energy that is used to make these machines, to make these trains, to build this power plant, and to clean it and run it. So we have to think about a whole system. When we're deciding on a fuel source for a job, we have to consider the energy return on energy invested. And this is easy to do. You take the energy obtained, so that would be the final 35 right here. You divide it by the energy invested, which would be the 100 right here. Whatever number you get out of that is the EROI number. The higher the EROI number, the better the source of energy for the job. We're just about done. So considering the system's efficiency idea, I'm just going to give you a quick comparison using water heaters. So you got electric water heaters, you got natural gas water heaters. Electric water heaters on their face value look to be more efficient because in electricity production, the major waste product is heat, but heat is what you want to heat. Uh, water. So basically inside your water tank you've got electricity running through a coil, a heating element. It's being uh, converted directly to heat. That process is like 99% efficient. So that looks really good compared to a natural gas water heater where you've got a flame underneath the heater heating the tank of the water and you lose um, heat out of that flame as waste. It's kind of exhaust. It leaves. So the conversion of energy to heat for a gas water heater might only be 80%. So at their face value electric water heater is better than the gas water heater. But then you have to consider the whole system. And we just talked about the fact that producing electricity using coal is only 35% efficient. So for the process of heating water using electricity, you're really only working like 34, 35% efficient if you go all the way back to the beginning. Producing uh, natural gas is a lot less energy intensive than producing electricity using uh, coal is. So the process of um, heating up that water using natural gas in the end is going to be more efficient on the natural gas end of things than it is on the uh, electric end of things. And here's our last slide for the day. When we talk about energy use, especially in America, we got to talk about the fact that transportation accounts for 30% of our energy consumption in America. Now this is transporting goods and people. And we have to consider the efficiency of a trip. Now, if we put it all together, you can compare trains and automobiles and buses and whatever else. Generally speaking, the more people that can ride in a vehicle, the more efficient it is because it's going to take about the same amount of energy to move that vehicle whether one person is riding in it or whether 50 people are riding in it. So you can take the total energy consumed and say this energy consumed applies to one person in the case of somebody driving alone in their car or applies to 50 people in the case of people riding in a bus. So if you take the consumption and divide it across 50 people, that means that each one of those 50 people is going to per capita use less energy than one person riding alone in a car. And I think that's it. That is our quick crash course into how energy is used in America and some considerations that need to be made. I hope it was helpful to you. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.